Hey, welcome to the gathering. Happy Mother's Day. Let's join together as we sing praise to God. Good morning. Welcome to the Gathering Baptist Church online. We are so thankful that you are tuning in on this Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. We hope that this is a good day for you and your families get to celebrate um, just everything that you mean to them. We have a short video for you this morning of people in our congregation that just want to express their thanks. We hope that you enjoy it. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. You're the best ever. We love you. Happy Mother's Day, every mother in the world. Happy Mother's Day. We love you. 
Happy Mother's Day. Thank you for all you do. Gathering Moms, you're the best. Keep up the great work. Really proud of you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Thanks for all that you have done for me over the years and for still looking out for me. Um, we love you very much and we hope that you have a wonderful day. Happy Mother's Day. I love you. You're the best mom I could ever have. Thank you so much, Mom. I love you. Happy Mother's Day! Hi, Hi everybody! Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day! Happy Mother's Day! We love you! We love, we love you, Mom! Mom. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day! Just so want to say thank you to all our grandmas, our moms, uh, guardians, and all those who fulfill the role of mom in someone's life. We appreciate you so much. We love you. Happy Mother's Day! Just want to say Happy Mother's Day to my mom. I love you so much. Thanks for all you do. Shout out to my wife for raising three beautiful kids. I love you so much. Have a great and blessed Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you for being the glue that holds us all together and everything that you do for us. Love you. We appreciate you, moms. Thank you so much. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. Happy Mother's Day, mom. I love you, Mom. You're the best. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms that are out there. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Hope you enjoyed some time with your family today. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Love you. I just wanted to say a real good Happy Mother's Day to my mother and to all the mothers in our church. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you. Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. I love you. Thanks for all you do. Bye. Bye. I love you. Hi, Mom. I miss you and love you very much. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Hope you have a good day. Appreciate all you do for me. I love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. From your favorite son and favorite daughter-in-law. We love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I want to say Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers of Gathering Baptist Church. I want to say um, Happy Mother's Day to my mom, Masako, and to my wife, Shanna, and then to all the adopted moms that we have in the church. Thank you for loving on the pastors and loving on the people of our church. We just pray that you have a special day today. Again, Happy Mother's Day. We hope that you have a fantastic day. Thank you for all that you do. Don't forget, seniors, parents of seniors, next week is Grad Sunday. We still want to celebrate the high school seniors and college seniors and all that they have done in the midst of this pandemic. We, we are so um, thankful for them and the witness that they are to uh, the church family and their uh, communities as a whole. So don't forget, parents, make sure to get those pictures in, the details of graduation and everything like that. Get that into me, Matt at GatheringKC.com as soon as possible. Also, I know that many of you are anxious about getting back into church, uh, being able to uh, meet together again, and we are too. Uh, please be in prayer for us as we formulate a plan, we think through um, guidelines, government guidelines. We as a staff are wanting to make the best decision possible, so just be in prayer for us as we formulate those plans. Again, we are thankful for you jo for joining us um, this morning. Let me pray, and we will get started with worship. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for a day that we can rest in your presence. Lord, we can sing songs to you and read your word. Uh, just impart wisdom to our souls this morning. Lord, be with us and guide us and direct us in this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. the goodness of God. 
Jesus, that we find strength and power in your forgiveness, in your mercy, that those who call upon the name of the Lord can be saved. So we pray, Lord, that those watching, that they would, that they would know the resurrection power of Jesus Christ today.
Good morning, church. Hey, it's so good once again to be with you uh, this morning. Have you ever been confused? Uh, And I don't mean the kind of confused like when you can't get the toaster to work only to find out that it wasn't plugged in, right? I think we've all been there in some way, shape, or form. Why is my uh, phone not charging? It's because the charger wasn't plugged in. Uh, Or it was just the wrong charger, right? But have you ever been confused? I mean, like, really confused, right? I remember the first time I heard the phrase A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Solve for B. I was like, what are you talking about right now? None of this even makes sense. Uh, None of this makes sense. Uh, this, This is completely ridiculous. And I am not just confused, but this can't even be a real thing. Right? These moments when we have this deep, deep confusion, we, we need a whole, whole lot of clarification in these moments, don't we? We need to go to these gurus, these magicians, these who are fluent in the dark arts of this thing called mathematics. And so we run to these mathematicians to solve for B, because the rest of us, normal folk, Uh, are just confused out of our minds, right? In a lot of ways, uh, this is kind of where we kind of pick up today, right? Uh, Where we're just confused, where we don't understand certain things, and so we run to the guru uh, for some clarification and for some answers. And So if you have your Bible, we're going to kind of dig through this question today that a man named Nicodemus asked Jesus. He kind of asked these questions uh, in John chapter 3, uh, this, how are, we, how are we saved then? How in the world does all of this work? I thought I had it all together, and now I'm just confused. So John chapter 3 is where we're going to kind of be today and work through this today. I'm going to read it as we always do, read through these verses, verse 1 to 21, pray, and then we're going to kind of walk through it verse by verse and then jump into some things that we really feel like the Lord is teaching us in these verses today. So let's read this together. The book of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. The Word of God says this, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things, these signs that you do, unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him, saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you not a teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony." If I've told you earthly things and you do not believe them, how can, I, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except who, he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world." And people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, 
so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Let's pray together this morning, and then we'll walk through this a little bit. Father, we, we trust your word to be enough. God, we trust your, your word to teach us uh, what it means to, to live in light, to believe in the good news of God. That We, we trust your word to, to, to bring us to life, Father. And so, God, this morning, I pray for us across the city that you would transform our minds, you would open our eyes to the good news of your word, to the good news of the gospel, Father. God, that as you, as you sit here in this moment and you teach Nicodemus and you teach your disciples, Father, I pray that you would teach us and help us to learn and sit under your teaching, Father, I pray. God, be upon my heart and upon my mind and upon my tongue this morning. Father, help me to think clearly and communicate clearly as well. God, we pray. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our Christ and our King. Amen. John chapter 3. I I love the book of John because John really just dives straight into Jesus' ministry. He just jumps head first and says, okay, let's just go at it here. And so he jumps straight in. And in John chapter 2, there's a few things that happen interesting in John chapter 2 as Jesus begins his ministry. Uh, He begins his ministry with a a, a miracle, a miracle that you're probably familiar with, uh, a, a miracle of changing water into wine. And he looks at his mother and has this interesting interaction, yet he does what his mother kind of commands or asks him to do anyways. And so Jesus, he, he jumps, or John jumps right into Jesus' ministry here in, in the book of John, and he, and he does the same thing here in John chapter 3. He just jumps straight in to some big, deep theological teaching that Jesus kind of shares with Nicodemus here. And so let's walk through this a little bit, verses 1 through 21 of John chapter 3. It goes like this. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. So John tells us very clearly who Jesus is communicating with here and some of the questions that this man, this Pharisee, has towards Jesus. John tells us very clearly who he is and what he's about. He's a Pharisee. He's a ruler of the Jews, right? We all have these, uh, I think we have these thoughts on who the Pharisees were and what the Pharisees were all about, but just real quickly, uh, you know, these Pharisees, they, they looked at the law and they said the law is what is going to save us. The law and following the law, uh, being obedient to every jot and tittle in the law, all of the little things, it's, that's what's going to redeem us. That's what's going to help us be like God, right? And so in Judaism, Judaism teaches that there are 613 commandments, right? 248 do's, things that they, you need to do, 365 don'ts. And Nicodemus was one of these as a Pharisee, as a ruler of the Jews, as a teacher of the law. Nicodemus was one of these who would be committed to keeping all of these laws, he, w- he would have looked at all of his people, at his family, everyone around him, and said, I am committed to, t- to keeping these 248 do's and these 600 and, or I'm sorry, <laughs> 365 don'ts. I'm committed to keeping all of these things. Every ounce of my being will follow the law, no matter what. And so it says here that Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews, comes to Jesus. And it's interesting how John says that he comes to Jesus and how Nicodemus comes to Jesus. It says he comes to Jesus by night, under way of darkness. There's a lot of different ways that you can kind of run with this here. But he comes to Jesus in the secrecy of night. And there's a lot of different things that you can run with here, but I think the biggest thing here is that Nicodemus had some very pressing questions that he needed Jesus to answer. And it would almost come off like he he needed to come to Jesus in a moment where nobody else was going to see him come to Jesus, right? Uh, Throughout the Gospels, we see, or especially John's Gospel, we see many folks who believed that Jesus was who he said he was, but they didn't want to, they kept it secret, right? They kept it secret for fear of men like Nicodemus, the Pharisees and the ruler of the Jews, because they wanted to continue to worship in the synagogue. They wanted to continue to be able to bring sacrifices and such. And so they keep their worship of Jesus a secret. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus uh, uh, under, under the shadow of night in a lot of ways, to kind of keep it a secret that he was searching out some answers from this, from this teacher, from this rabbi, from Jesus. And he comes to Jesus as such. He comes to Jesus, not in a condemning way, but he looks at Jesus and he actually calls Jesus 
teacher. He says, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs unless God is with him. So look at what Nicodemus, this Pharisee, right? This Pharisee, he looks at Jesus and says, Jesus, we recognize that there is something godly about you. We, we fully recognize uh, and we're willing to admit even, okay, we're willing to admit even that God is obviously with you. For none of these things would be possible if God was not with you, right? We're willing to admit this, but I have some questions. I need to figure out what in the world is all of this about? What is going on here? I'm not yet ready to admit that, that you are the Son of God, but I'm willing to admit that there is something godly about you, that you are obviously from God in some way, shape, or form. And this is Jesus' response. Kind of a weird response, but this is Jesus' response in verse 3. I think Jesus obviously knows Nicodemus' heart. He knows his state. He knows that he's coming to Jesus with some questions here about salvation, okay? Because Nicodemus, all of his salvation, all of his, his, his knowledge of, of, of the, his ability to get to heaven is in his morality, is in, is in his keeping of the law. And so Jesus looks into his heart here, and in verse 3 gives him a response. Jesus answered him. He said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He says to Nicodemus, he says, Yes, yes, Nicodemus, in, in your coming to me, you're almost there. You're searching in all the right places right now. You've been searching uh, the Old Testament law for me this entire time. You're you're recognizing that all of these Old Testament things, they're pointing to me, and now you've sought me out. Yes, Nicodemus, you're almost there. But unless one is born again, born, maybe better translated, born from above, unless one is born from above, then you cannot see heaven. This is what Jesus shares with them here, and you can look at chapter 1, verse 13, or 2 Corinthians 5, 17 for this idea of being born from above. But he says, unless one is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot grab a hold of this inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled and unfading. Unless you are born from above, he says. Nicodemus' response Remember, he's just sitting here. He's just confused right now. Jesus, I came to you because I couldn't figure out how to, how to charge my phone, and now you've left me with this A squared plus B squared equals C squared thing. So now he's just thoroughly confused. Nicodemus says in verse 4, Nicodemus says to him, but how in the world can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again? Now Nicodemus is just talking crazy. Okay. He's, just, he's just thoroughly confused now. Jesus looks back at Nicodemus and answers and says, Yes, again, Nicodemus, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. In other words, he looks at Nicodemus and says this, Unless, you are, unless you're baptized, okay, unless you have been set apart for my kingdom, Unless you've been thoroughly set apart, and unless the Spirit lives in you, you're baptized and you receive the Spirit of God, unless these things take place in your life, this setting apart and this receiving of the Spirit of God, unless these things take place in your life, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 6, he goes on, he says, you see, Nicodemus, that which is born of flesh is sinful. The things that are born in the flesh, they're sinful things, but the things that are born in the Spirit are sinless things. This is what you need to understand, that there is nothing that you can do or participate in in your flesh to make yourself sinless, but that which is born in the Spirit, Jesus, this is what can save you. This sinless one can save you. Look at verse 7, Jesus looks at me and says, don't be shocked. Don't, don't, don't be shocked that I'm saying these things to you, he says. You must be born again. He says, the, the, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born in the Spirit. Essentially, Jesus looks at him and says, listen, the Spirit is blowing around here. You may not know the Spirit's coming or going, but you definitely feel its effects and its works. We look at the Spirit's work in a person's life, Jesus says, and we see fruit of that. 
It's not just this, uh, it, we just see this fruit of, of the Spirit of God in the works of people's lives. This is how Jesus kind of continues to talk with, with Nicodemus here. In verse 9, Nicodemus, again, he's looking at him, he's scratching his head. He says, Jesus, but how in the world can this happen? How in the world does all of this take place? Again, I'm just thoroughly confused here, Jesus, and I need some help. And he says, and Jesus answered him. And finally, he's, you could almost sense some of Jesus, maybe frustration even. He looks at Nicodemus and he says, Nicodemus, you are a teacher of all of Israel and you don't know these things? You're supposed to be the one who stands in front of everyone and interprets my Old Testament, my word, and shares the good news of me with all of these people and you don't understand these things? He's just frustrated almost even at him. Verse 11, truly, truly, I say to you, Here's what, I, here's, here's what I have for you, Nicodemus. Here's what you need to sit in and remember and think about right now. He says, truly I say to you, we, the disciples, John the Baptist, the prophets of old even, we, we speak what we know, we bear witness to what we've seen, we share with you all of this stuff. We're teaching you. We've been teaching you all of this stuff already. And you don't want anything to do with it. All of our teaching, all the teaching of John the Baptist, all the teaching of all of our prophets beforehand, you don't want anything to do with these things. We're teaching you these earthly things. You don't want anything to do with it, yet you're asking me how, how things in heaven work. You're asking me all of these deep theological questions when you don't understand the very basics. Verse 12, if I told you earthly things... You don't believe. How in the world are you going to believe if I tell you heavenly things? 13, no one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses, verse 14, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So here's interesting here. Jesus goes back and he, he, he uses something that Nicodemus would be very familiar with, the Old Testament, right? He uses this thing to, to relay himself being lifted up in front of the congregation he uses this, this thing here in Numbers, Numbers chapter 21. If you're familiar, there's this interesting story that takes place in Numbers 21 where the people of God, the Israelites, are, uh, go figure, complaining again. They're complaining again about why Moses, why God pulled them out, saved them from slavery in Egypt. Why, God, would you save us from slavery? Why would you pull us out of that horrible environment and, and, and save us from these things? Why, God, would you do this? Why, God, would you do this? And, 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 and once again, God's kind of like, you know what? Y'all are ridiculous. And so here's what God does. It's kind of a crazy thing, Old Testament story that God does, right? God sends a bunch of poisonous snakes to bite the Israelites, and many of them die. And so they're groaning again because all these poisonous snakes are, are biting the Israelites and they're dying. So, God, so that now they're groaning back to God, oh, God, save us, oh, God, save us. And they start to repent. They start to say, God, save us, God, help, God, we're sorry, things like this. So then God looks at Moses and he says, Moses, uh, make a bronze serpent, uh, put it up on a pedestal for everyone to see, and uh, anyone who looks at, the, at this bronze serpent, this bronze snake on this pedestal, anyone who simply looks at it will be saved, right? And so he, Jesus very clearly relates himself to this, all you have to do is look to me, Jesus says of himself, all you have to do is look to me, just like the Israelites looked at that bronze snake, and you will be saved. The remedy to these venomous snake bites was God. The remedy to sin is Jesus, verse 15, and whoever believes in him may have eternal life. This is what he says. You, you believed in this bronze serpent to save you. You believe in me, the one who is now lifted up to save you. Verse 15, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life because, here's why. Why, why must this one be lifted up? Here's why. Because God so passionately loved his creation. Because God so passionately loved his creation, he sent his son Jesus into the world to save the world. That anyone who looks, who believes, that anyone who looks and trusts in Jesus will be saved. 
This is what John's saying here. This is what Jesus is saying here as he's communicating with his disciples and with Nicodemus. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Why? God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn the world because the world was already condemned. <laughs> okay? the, the world did not need a king to come in and condemn. Right? The world was already going to hell. The world was already full of sin. Right? But this is what the Jewish leaders wanted. The Jewish leaders wanted this king to come in and cast out Roman rule. Right? The, the, the Jewish leaders wanted this king, and they thought this king was going to come in and, and save them, condemn and judge all of the other wicked people, all of the outsiders, all of those who did not fully obey the law. They were, he was going to come in and judge the, those people. Right? And, and, and save us. It says very clearly here, though, verse 17, God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn the world because the world was already condemned, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God was not looking to condemn in Jesus. God was looking to save in Jesus. Verse 18, that whoever believes in him is not found guilty, but whoever does not believe is already guilty. They've been guilty and they didn't even know it because he does not actively believe in the, name of, in the name of the only Son of God, Jesus the Christ. Now, verse 19, we're finishing up here through all of this. This is the judgment. This is the court's conclusion, John says, Jesus says. This is the court's conclusion that the light has come into the world, that I have come into the world, and people have been actively seeking sin, darkness, instead of actively seeking me, light. People actively sought the things of the world. They actively sought evil things. Why? Because they were evil. We actively seek out these evil things because there's evil living in us. Verse 20, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and doesn't come to the light because if he comes to the light, all of his wicked evil deeds will be fully exposed in the light. And so we run away from the light because we don't want to be exposed by the light. Verse 21, Jesus ends like this, though. He says, but whoever does what is true runs to the light. Whoever does what is, what is true, though, who's ever actively living in the light, though, who's ever living in repentance, they run to the light so that, they may be, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God that Jesus' works have been carried out. So there's a lot in here, as we've obviously seen, uh, as we've read through it a little bit. And, and so there's just a few things. There's this question that kind of hangs after we read through Scripture like this, right? And this, there's this question that, that hangs there, and it's a question that goes like this. What does this teach us, though? So what, what, what did Nicodemus, what do we need to learn from Jesus in this moment? There's a few things, four things, I think, actually, that Jesus teaches us here uh, that Nicodemus learns that we need to learn. The first one is this. First and foremost, we need to learn, because Nicodemus definitely learned in this moment as well, that morality does not save us. All of the things that Nicodemus thought he was doing right that would save him. Jesus just brushes those things by the wayside in this moment. You see, morality does not save us. Morality does not save Nicodemus. And listen, I think guys like Nicodemus struggled with this throughout Jesus' ministry, life and ministry, possibly even their entire lives. They just struck, they've been, they've been brought up under this, in, in, in this environment of do good, do right, maybe even do better than that guy, and Jesus will love you then. If you, then Jesus. If you, then Jesus. This is the world that Nicodemus, that Paul, that all of these, Joseph of Arimathea that we see in John 19, this is the world that all of these folks, they grew up in. If you, then Jesus. And so they struggle with this. When, when, when Jesus kind of outlines to these men that morality doesn't save you, that your pharisaical lifestyle doesn't save you, that living by the law doesn't save you, they struggle here. Listen, we struggle here, don't we? I struggle here. I struggle in thinking that if, if, I, can, if I do this, 
if I accomplish this, then Jesus will accept me or like me better or bless me. If I, then Jesus. How many times do we fall into these things? John tells us several times uh, throughout his gospel, throughout his, his gospel, that many, many leaders, including, including uh, Nicodemus and so many others, uh, they didn't speak of Jesus as the Messiah for fear of the Jews. You see, they, they, they wanted to believe, but they were scared here. Even though they believed or they wanted to believe, they didn't speak of or seek out Jesus because they were scared of, uh, of, of all these folks, right? See, Jesus makes it very clear to Nicodemus that in this moment, uh, in this moment, Jesus could have looked at Nicodemus and said, you know what, Nicodemus, you're, you're doing great. You're doing a good job. I want to confirm for you what you're thinking. I want to confirm for you in this moment that the way you're living is good. Keep it up. How do you think Nicodemus would have left in that moment? I mean, he would have been rubbing his hands like, all right, Jesus gave me confirmation that the way that I'm living, that doing right means Jesus will, right? But Jesus here, and instead he completely rearranges, he re- completely rearranges Nicodemus' idea that morality saves, Right? How then, Nicodemus says, how then am I supposed to come into your kingdom? How does this whole salvation thing work? Jesus completely flips it on its head again. He says, Nicodemus looks at Jesus and says, I'm willing. I'm willing to hear. I'm willing to learn. I want you to teach me. Teach me, he says. And so Jesus teaches. And this is what Jesus does. Jesus teaches in a very simple way. He very simply preaches the gospel. If you were to look back at these verses a little bit, you would, you would see a few words that really stick out. If you were to read back through these, there's, there's three words that really stick out or three phrases that really stick out through these verses. One of those words or phrases is, is born or born again. Six times Jesus uses this word or this phrase. A little further down, you'll see the word believe that he who would believe, right? Seven times Jesus uses this phrase, believe. And then again, a little further down, five, at the very end, five times, Jesus equates himself with light. So here's what I think Jesus, here's how Jesus teaches the gospel to Nicodemus and his disciples who are standing around. First of all, he says this. He says, you must be born from above. This is how Jesus teaches the gospel to Nicodemus here. He says, you must be born from above. The old must be removed and the new must be installed. This is how Ezekiel puts it. Okay? And, he, and, and Nicodemus would have understood these things for knowing all of the, the law and the prophets so well. He goes back and he says, you must be born from above. All of the old must be removed. The new must be installed. Remember, remember how Ezekiel says it, he says. Ezekiel puts it like this in chapter 36, verse 25. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you will be clean from all your uncleanliness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will put it within you, and I will remove your heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God." He says, you must be born from again. And and, and as this new thing is installed, as you are born again, as, as as you are born from above, as this new thing is installed inside of you, everything changes. Everything in your life will begin and has to begin because all this old stuff is taken out and this new stuff is put in. Everything will change, he says, beginning with your belief. So the third thing. He says, morality doesn't save. You must be born from above, and you must believe. Jesus looks at Nicodemus, looks at us, and he says, it's not your moral piety that saves you. Be as pious as you want. That's not going to save you. It's not going to remedy this chasm between you and God. It's not, this, it's not in pharisaic legalism. You must believe in the one who was lifted up, Jesus says. This is what you must believe. You must must be willing to simply, simply look up at the one who was lifted up and put your trust and your hope in him and him alone. 
This is what you must do. You must believe. You must believe in the one who came from heaven to remedy our condemnation. I didn't come to condemn. I came to fix it. This is what Jesus says. You must believe these things because if you continue to look to and trust your ability, he says, then you're doomed. The more you look to your morality to fix it, the more doomed you are because the further away from me you get, the more you look to your your legalism to fix it, to remedy it, the further away from me you get, the more you take it upon yourself, the more burdened and bogged down you become. He says you must believe. And finally, he says this towards the end here. He says you must live in the light. You must believe. Live in the light, he says to to Nicodemus, to the disciples, to me and you, and listen, this is probably my favorite part of all of this, and it's the hardest part. (laughs) It's my favorite part, and it's the hardest part. Here's why. Because I, um, I regularly, even though I don't necessarily want to or like it, but I regularly sit in, even run to self-consciousness. I I will regularly sit in self-pity. I will regularly sit in in, in self-preservation. I will regularly um, sit in in, in self-doubt. I will regularly uh, and actively even, I will actively run to my depressions and depravities. And I think maybe you do the same thing. I think maybe you do the same thing. You see, we, we, we live in the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And instead of running towards the light of the good news of God, uh, we sit in the ashes of our sin and shame. You see, this is my favorite part but it's also the hardest part to actually live in. It's easier to pout than it is to forgive. But I'm learning. But we're learning. We're we're learning together to live as His beloved. You see, we're we're learning together to enjoy the Lord, for He enjoys us. We're, We're learning together to know our Abba and to know that He is very fond of us. You see, this is what it means to live in the light that all of our sin, that all of our shame, has already been dealt with, and that nothing that can ever be exposed about us is ever going to cause the Father to look on us in any other way but love. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, my friends. This is the good news of God. You see, Nicodemus, Nicodemus' moral piety and, and moral purity did nothing for him but confuse him. And it does nothing for us but confuse us. Because what if I fail? Because what if I don't? Because what if I can't? Because what if I mess it up? The gospel speaks something and sings something so much more beautiful over the top of us. And that beautiful thing the gospel sings over the top of us is not uh, moral piety. It is very simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will live. This is the good news of God, friends. And Jesus looks at Nicodemus. He looks at us because we're a lot like Nicodemus in this scenario. He looks at us, and he encourages us. He urges us even. He says, live in light. He says, live in light. You see, light, living in light bears this surprising consequence. It bears a surprising consequence, this, uh, this surrender to sacredness, which is much easier to live under. When we live, you see, when we live in the light, 
When, when we live in the light, bearing, it, it bears this surprising consequence, this surrendering to sacredness, that Jesus, that God in Jesus looks at us and calls us now holy. And listen, knowing these things, knowing these things is much easier to live in and under than all of my moral insecurities. <laughs> And so, my friends, here's my encouragement today. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because morality doesn't save. Because you must be born from above. Because you must believe, and Jesus edifies and encourages us to live in the light of all of these truths. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ today, friends. Let me pray with you and pray for you. Father, we love you. Father, we love your good news We love your good news because it clarifies all of these questions that we have. God, what if I fail? What if I fall? What if I run? What if I sit in my shame and sin? What if if I don't? What if I mess it up? God, your gospel sings a different and completely completely different song over the top of us. The, The song your gospel sings over us is a song of sacredness is a song of of, of redemption, Father. That now you look on us as you look on Jesus as one of your own, Father. And so, Father, this morning, I pray for all of your people that we collectively together, that we together would remember the beauty of your gospel that we together would remember and believe more, believe again, and continue to learn what it means and looks like to live as your beloved, to enjoy you because you enjoy us, and to know that you are very fond of us. Solidify these things in our hearts and in our minds today, I pray. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Father. It's in your name we pray. Amen. reach for me and pull me from the raging sea and I am safe on the solid ground the Lord is my salvation
glory be to God the Father. Glory be to God the Son. Glory be to God the Spirit. The Lord is my salvation. Thanks for joining us for worship this morning. We hope that you will share and comment and like. We will see you next week for Grad Sunday.